Welcome to the CBS Eye on Money podcast. It is Thursday, June 24th. I'm Jill Schlesinger, and I am joined by executive producer extraordinaire Mark Talercio. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm good. Just snacking on a handful of blueberries here. Blueberries? Are you off your nut habit? Remember when we were in the studio and you would eat like a pound of nuts when we were together? <laughs> No, that habit continues to this day. I still have a bag. I'm looking at it right now. I'll get to that later this afternoon. Oh, okay. Very good. Mark, it's an exciting day today because the gross domestic product is out. And uh, I know that that's something that's just wowing the universe. But part of this show, in addition to taking your questions, answering those financial questions, is to give you a little education. So Mark and I are going to educate you a little bit. Gross domestic product market is the broadest measure of the U.S. economy. So here's how this report works. Every quarter, the government will do a analysis and say, here's how much money that was total spending, goods, services, everything, the whole economy, and they tally it up. They give you three different versions of this for each quarter. So today we're getting the final results for the first quarter of 2021. We've already had two releases. And here's where we are. We are at a annualized pace of 6.4% growth. That's what we thought we were at in the second result. It's probably about 6.5%, which is, I think something that is taken for granted. Like that's a huge amount of growth. You know, we used to have growth mark of, I don't know, 3%, 2.5%, 3% for about 10 years. Then we had this massive contraction. That was last year. It was the end of the first quarter, but the second quarter was really horrible. It was like 30% drop. And now here we are, we're on the march higher and things have been looking up. Are you upbeat about growth going forward, Mark? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's going to be a very strong second half of the year. And it's going to be strong because the economy has opened up. It's going to be strong because there's lots of jobs. It's strong because people have pent up demand. And so we're going to keep growing. But here's the real question that I have. And I'm not an economist. So uh, let me just pose this question out there for the economists who are listening to us. I'm sure you are listening. And that is, what happens after this year? That's kind of the big question, because this is a weird year. Last year was a crazy year. This year's a crazy year. But then where do we settle back down? Are we going to see higher levels of growth going forward? I don't know. But, you know, frankly, if we could be at 3% growth in the next couple of years, whoop, that would be fantastic. Um, and we would see lots of jobs and we would see wage growth. But I'm still a little concerned about inflation, Mark. So we'll be talking more about that throughout this show in the future because we're going to keep an eye on these things. We want to have you at least be in touch with these terms. So here's your big picture. GDP, it's released quarterly. There are three versions of it. And when it's reported, it's usually reported not for what happened in that quarter, but in the US, what we do is we talk about what is, if growth were to continue at the same pace in the current quarter for the full year ahead, what would that be? So that's why we talk about the 6.4% annualized for the whole year. All right, so- what is important about all of this is not so much that you know it and predict it, but that you're familiar with some of these terms. It'll help you understand the, the headlines that you read, and I'll help you make sense of it. If you have a question about some economic report, if you have a question about something you've read or encountered or something that's going on, sort of big picture economy, feel free to send us an email. It's very easy to do. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Or if you're on our website, jillonmoney.com, you can always ask a question right there. Just hit the contact button. Then of course, we would also like to hear from you if you have a question about your personal financial situation. Okay. Send us an email, ask us your question. Let us know what's on your mind. And that is what Eric did. Eric writes that this is so funny. My child bride of 48 years and I have adopted six kids. Oh my God. They're adults and there's grandkids as well. Yep. Grandkids. Two of our adult children have special needs, one Downs and one cerebral palsy quad. And we need to try to provide as much cabbage as we can for them when we pass. So our retirement plan is conservative. We can live on my pension and social security plus about a 3% withdrawal on our nest egg. That's great. So guys, I just want to translate a few things for you, which is 
that withdrawal rate, like when you save a whole bunch of money, you can try to figure out how much you can draw from your nest egg by using a 3% withdrawal w- rate. And that will hopefully last you through your retirement years. It's not a perfect way to do it, but it's it's a, not a bad way to start. And Eric goes on to say that with a 3% withdrawal, they can take care of their needs and should maybe even be able to grow it a little bit. I plan on working until I drop over or they fire me (laughs) as I enjoy my job. We um, fired our money manager at a large, he put it in quotes, my money manager at a large firm a few years ago. I moved it all to Vanguard. Best move ever so far. Thanks for that advice, by the way. The one and a half percent fee was not getting us anything other than a pat on the back and a hand in my wallet. After doing the math for our retirement planning, we've come up with what we think works for us, but it seems a little too simple. Um, They did something called a portfolio visualizer, which is kind of cool. It's online software and analytics to help you make decisions. I just checked it out, portfoliovisualizer.com. Um, They found that using one fund seemed to work well. We checked target date funds, different investment plans and ideas. The Vanguard Wellesley Admiral Fund seems to fit our plans best. Are we nuts for putting all of our eggs in one basket? I know Vanguard's pretty great company and all that, but I worry about one fund. I guess people do one target date fund and that would be okay. It doesn't seem to be so nuts. The allocation is 40% stocks, 60% bonds. The fees are 0.16% overall. Not bad. Is one fund and done a bad idea? Should we just do 40% in the Vanguard stock market index and 60% in the bond index? Help, please. Thank you so much. I appreciate all you do. I enjoy the pod. And now the new Eye on Money pod as well. I wish I could get each player on our team your book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. It should be a college course for success after graduation. Okay, Mark, how do you feel about one fund? Um, How do I feel about one fund? Yeah, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it. The only thing is for me personally, you know, he wants to be a conservative. So maybe... In a few years, he wants to get even more conservative or he wants to you know, not be so conservative. You can't go into that fund and adjust things. So for me, I would rather just have the total stock market fund and the total bond market fund. That way I can tweak with the percentages if I want down the line. I mean, and maybe this is something that you you can put it, you can set it and forget it right now, right? And it's a 60-40 fund, right? 60 bond, 40 stock. And maybe that's fine. And, and as Mark says, if you feel like maybe as you age and things are moving forward in your life, you want to try to scale that risk back a little bit. Well, then maybe you'll have to just take some of the money from that and put it into a bond fund as Mark prescribes. But essentially, I don't think it's bad either. I don't really know how much money you have that's going into this fund, but I'm into like set it and forget it. By the way, Mark, don't you think we should request some swag from the football program? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good call. Yes, absolutely. I thank you. Eric, now you are a recidivist questioner, which we love. But if you want to send us a baseball cap, I'll be happy to wear it. I wear anyone's baseball cap swag or T-shirts. Or a mug. Or mug. Uh, Mark knows that my favorite T-shirt of all time is the T-shirt that I have from one of our radio stations, a CBS affiliate called Wood Radio in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the slogan of that particular station in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is you're waking up with wood. And I am not making that up, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much. Uh, Eric, one fund. Do it. Okay. By the way, uh, sometimes you have a a subject line in your emails to us here at at Ion Money that catches my eye. Um, And if you're sending us an email, the email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Or if you're coming from our website, which is called Jill on Money, you can just hit the contact button. And the subject on this particular message is marriage proposal, which I thought I was actually being proposed to, Mark. (laughs) Yeah, when, when when I first got that in the inbox, that's exactly what I thought, too. Ben starts by saying, hi, Jill. Although I'm a a huge fan of your show, I am not proposing to you. Uh, I'm proposing to my girlfriend. That's so nice. Good for you, Ben. 
Ben says, we've been together for three years. We just closed on a home together. Oh my God, they bought a house before they got married. Sound familiar, Mark? I'm wondering what the tax implications (laughs) are if we decide to get married this year versus next year. I earn about $100,000. She earns about thirty dollars to $40,000 as the 51% owner of a growing family business. What should we consider in terms of tax benefits of home purchases and filing as single or married? Thanks in advance for any advice you can offer from Ben. Okay, here's the deal. If you, as a single person, make hundred grand, you are in the 24% tax bracket. She... As earning 30 to, what did she say? 30 to 40, she is in a very, she's in a 12% tax bracket. Okay. Now let's put you guys together. And if you make a hundred and she makes 30 or 40, what happens? It's the majority of your income is actually taxed at the 22% tax bracket. So here's what I think. There's no real downside about the getting married thing. For her, because she's the owner of this family business and it's growing, she probably can whittle down a lot of her income through the small business. If you're just a wage employee, there's nothing you can really do about your your income. In terms of the house, it doesn't really matter. You can still split the deduction whether you're married or not. Mark, what's the difference about if they have kids? Isn't there a head of household differential? Didn't you run those numbers? Yeah, if they ha- if they file separately and they have kids, only one of them will be able to claim the child as a dependent, not both. I don't want to be anti-romantic, but it may be that it's not a huge difference for you guys that if you are in the 22% tax bracket for most of your income, I think that should be just fine. In terms of tax implications for this year versus next year, maybe if she happened to have, let's say, an old retirement account, if she was thinking about converting an old retirement account that is a traditional into a Roth, this is the time to do it. So while her income is in that 12% bracket, or maybe even just to think about converting and and doing something like that, that to me is when you really start to consider, should you take some action? Marriage? Nah, not so much. What do you think, Mark? I would say, do not base the decision on whether to get married or not on on how you want to file your taxes. You want to get married? Get married. Don't overthink it. All right. No overthinking on the marriage thing, Mark says. Okay. This is from EM who says, I come from a family where finances are not discussed. And so I've been learning as I go and so much more from your podcast. Thank you. Okay. EM lives in California. First in her family to go to a four-year university, 30 years old and makes 45 grand a year. She still lives at home. She has $24,000 in student loan debt, $8,000 $8,000 left to pay off on the car, $28,000 in savings. Mark, that's a good one, huh? Here's a, here's where the trouble begins. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm looking into moving out with my boyfriend. <laughs> okay. Um, they've been together for three years and he would like to go in on a mortgage instead of renting. He makes the same amount of income that I do. He only has car payments with $14,000 to pay off and $15,000 in savings. Oh my God, they've been approved for a $475,000 FHA mortgage, $495,000 for a conventional mortgage. The market's crazy right now. We've been looking for five months. We get outbid or shot down by cash offers. Would we be better off renting and using our savings to pay off as much of our debt as possible or put it towards a down payment on a home? That is, if we get lucky enough to have an offer that's accepted. Listen to the student loan interest rate, Mark. Five to seven percent. That's a big number. Car payment is just 0.9 percent. His car payment, 2.3 percent. Mark, should they rent and pay down their debt or should they start buying a house in the hottest housing market since the housing boom of 2005 six? Uh, not only not buy a home, but also not even rent. I would still live at home with the parents for a little while and just whack down that student loan debt. Just get rid of it. Yes, I totally agree. I was going to say the same thing, but I didn't want to sound like such a buzzkill EM. Uh, listen, I like the idea that you are first in your family to go to this to university. It's great. You have an income. I think that what is imperative is that you look at the money you have and you kill it 
on paying down that student loan debt. Okay. So obviously the student loan debt is in forbearance until September. And maybe these are, I don't know, she says five to 7% interest. I don't know if that's still, maybe she has some private loans, but anyway, I would pay that down. I would pay that down. I would pay that down. Absolutely do not buy a house. It's insane. That is you, you, neither of you is in the position to be able to afford to buy a house. So what you want to do is don't even consider a house until you would have to have paid off your student loans. He has to pay off his car loan and you both have to have six to 12 months of emergency reserve in the bank. I don't care that much about your car loan, frankly, but it's the student loan for you. And for him, come on, pay down the loan. And by the way, you didn't mention anything about saving for retirement. So, I mean, what we really want you to be thinking about, you're young, you've got your whole lives ahead of you. The calculation of rent versus buy has really tipped in the favor of renting in many areas. And so unless you can figure out how to buy a home and have it cost less, at least in the next few years, than renting, by the way, I'm sure you're not paying much in rent to your family, but in case you are still, it's okay. But rent, have flexibility. I mean, 90 grand a year, you should not be buying a half a million dollar house. I'm so mad that they even got approved, Mark. What do you think? That sounds like a recipe for disaster. Sound familiar? Yeah, exactly. Completely ridiculous. So what I suggest is pay down the debt, pay down the debt, pay down the debt, have your emergency reserve fund, and start using retirement accounts. If they are not available to you, then I'd love for you both to be putting money into a Roth IRA. Don't worry. Just put the house on the back burner. You don't have to do this. Really. Absolutely. And if your boyfriend needs to hear this, then have him contact me. All right. Oh God. I think I got a little bit on my hot horse there, Mark. <laughs> All right. If you like EM or anyone else you've heard on this podcast, if you want to have a financial question, we would love for you to send it to us. We have an email address. It's called askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. And if you're on our website, that website is jillonmoney.com. There's a contact button there. Feel free to bang it out. Send us your question. Let us know if you want to come on the air live. That is fun. All right. A few th bits of housekeeping here. Number one, could you leave us a rating or a review? We would so appreciate it. Number two, could you follow Eye on Money on Apple or anywhere else you get your favorite podcasts, please? And don't forget, by subscribing and following us, you will not miss an episode every Tuesday and Thursday. That's what we do here, okay? So much better to just subscribe and follow and get it done with it. Boop, shows up in your feed. Fantastic. Don't forget to do something nice for somebody else today. And also remember that we've got a mantra here at Eye on Money, and that mantra is curiosity, compassion, community. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Music.